Welcome back, everybody. Let's say hi to our friend, Mr. John Baptiste. Hello, John. Hello, Stephen. How you doing tonight? I'm I'm feeling great. I am mm -hmm. actually, you know, you know, some people some uh, they'll say to us sometimes like I really like watching your show because it yeah. makes me feel less alone and less crazy. This yeah. week did that for me. Oh yeah, yeah, it yeah. really does. It's a historic week, and I loved seeing the humanity in the DNC tonight. Braden Harrington, the 13 year old kid from New Hampshire. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that the the compassion of Vice President Biden to take the time and encourage him, it really moved me. I, I love to see that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, as I was saying earlier in the monologue, uh, Biden's essential decency is like water in the desert. It shouldn't yeah. be, but, but right now, you know, our, uh, you know, we don't presently have a leader who we can imagine uplifting someone. Right, we're not used to seeing it in four years. And I think the people have had enough, I'm hoping in 75 days that we're gonna change the course of history for the better. Knock wood. You got you got a little music to play us out. Something that's uh, what, what's your mood? I'm I'm feeling good. <laughs> Me too. John Baptiste, everybody. Thanks, John. Yes, indeed. We'll see you later. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest tonight made history in 2016 when she became the first woman to become the presidential nominee of a major political party. She went on to win the United States popular vote by three million votes. Please welcome former Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton. Madam Secretary, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Steve. It's a great night. I'm, I'm like John, I'm really optimistic and uh, so relieved and, and pleased about the convention. Uh, I am too, you know, it, uh, it was, it just sort of uh, showed me the, uh, a, a real hope, the real possibility that the answers are not one person who thinks they can solve everything, but people coming together with common cause. Yeah, I, I think that message came through really well over these last uh, four nights. It, you know, to me, what the team pulled off was unbelievable. The first ever virtual convention and the way I, that... They, totally they wove it all together was astonishing. I mean, as somebody who has been doing these sort these shows in COVID <laughs> with no audience and like you have to generate <laughs> your own energy and your own purpose every night, I was completely blown away. Like as yeah. a professional to a professional, <laughs> I couldn't believe what they achieved. Yeah, no, well, I, I, I watch you uh, at night and I, I get tired from just doing the Zooms that I do on a daily basis. And there you are at, in your house. I guess you're still in, are you still in your house? I can't No, I'm in, my, I'm in a reproduction of my office, but my family's still here. My son is still <laughs> one of my crew tonight. He waves Excellent. hi. He waves yeah, well, hi to you, by the way. Keep it in the family. I like that. Now, okay, let's talk about the the Zoom convention. You gave your speech last night. Um, mm -hmm. What was first of all? What was that like um, to be giving the speech? Because you've given many speeches at conventions before. You know what that energy normally is. What did it feel like? Did did you and Bill just put up cutout cards, you know, cards of people around like they do at Major League Baseball now? How did you how did you approach giving the speech? Well, I did it from my living room, which is where I am now. And it's not a very big room. And the DNC sent a really great crew to film it. And they had to, of course, have two cameras so they could have the cutaways. It got really tight, Stephen. And mm -hmm. so I was nervous because it is hard to give a speech just into a camera. And mm -hmm. you don't have the, you know, the sense that you're communicating and people are responding. Um, but you know, these are these are odd times. You do the best you can. Well, I I want to uh, commend you for something because you, uh, I believe, resisted the temptation, and you have the absolute right to say, "I told you so." <laughs> you didn't well, literally we, say those words. Yeah, I was thinking that could be about the shortest speech in convention history, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I just told you drop so. Drop the mic. That's exactly right. Because you did tell us so. You really well, did tell us so. I because I was I was reading some of your convention speech from four years ago. You told us yeah. then. Well, but you know, I think it was really difficult for most Americans, um, even people planning to vote for me, uh, to believe uh that it could be possibly as bad as I feared it would be. And as I said last night. Uh, you know, the morning after the election, I 
stated that we had to give, you know, Donald Trump a chance, and we have tried. But I think you've heard uh, throughout the four nights of the convention, you know, people saying, look, you know, he just either is incapable or unwilling uh, to fulfill the responsibilities of being our president. And now people know it. They, they've watched it in real time for, you know, more than three and a half years. You know, I think um, in a strange way, I, uh, I take people having voted for Donald Trump not believing that it would be this bad as somehow um, a, uh, a sign that they don't perceive everything as transactional and selfishly. They just didn't imagine anybody could be so um, lack in service of others and only in service of their own appetites. They just didn't believe anyone would be like that, which sort of says something nice about the American people, I suppose. Well, look, we've never had this experience. I mean, it's not like we've had, you know, perfect presidents. We all know that's not the case. And, you know, a lot of uh, challenges uh, throughout uh, our history. But to have someone who is only concerned about himself mm. and trying to feather his own nest and create an environment in which people have to tell him what he wants to hear, I, I think that was unimaginable uh, for most Americans. And even uh, for me, after the election, I thought, okay, you know, uh, he's going to be the president. The office has a way of almost imposing the responsibility onto you. And then when I went to the inauguration and I heard that speech, I got really worried. And my worry has only been compounded. Mm -hmm. But, you know, rather than just focusing on uh, the fact that he did turn out to be ill-equipped and unfit for the job, I think what we saw tonight with Joe Biden was so positive and reassuring. I mean, that speech was the speech of a lifetime. I, I've heard Joe speak on the Senate floor. I've, I've heard him speak um, at events in the Obama administration when I was Secretary of State. This was a speech that came from deep within himself in a way that I hope Americans could feel the determination, the sincerity, the profound decency uh, that he is offering to our country. Um, is there any part of you that wishes you could take another crack at Trump, like another shot at this? Well, no. Um, I, I take cracks at him all the time because... <laughs> no, you do, but any I, part of you I, wish he'd run. <laughs> no, but I, I, I live in a in a a constant state of um, both anxiety and possibility uh, because I I really believe what uh, Barack Obama said. I believe what others uh, said uh, in these uh, four nights of the convention, that this election is truly existential. And by that, you know, will our democracy continue? Will we have a country that resembles at all uh, who we think we are and the values undergirding us. And I don't know any other way of addressing it than to be as you know, outspoken as I can be in support now of the Biden-Harris ticket, because it, it is simply unimaginable that we're not going to retire Donald Trump and all of his enablers and try to get our country back on the right track. But you know Joe Biden well. Uh, when he was vice president and you were secretary of state, I understand you guys had breakfast a couple times a week. What well, you, once a week. Yeah, once, once a week. week. Tuesday right. morning. Right. Tuesday mornings. Okay. What uh, What do you know about Joe Biden that um, prepares him to answer that 3 a.m. phone call, as you so famously coined? Well, I know that he has been preparing his entire adult life for responsibilities of leadership. And... I've seen him in the Situation Room. I've seen him on the Senate floor. I've sat across from him in a, on a little table in the uh, vice president's residence uh, Tuesday mornings at 8 o'clock. And we've talked through, you know, just about every issue you can imagine. You know, he's such a thoughtful um, person, and he's very deliberative. He really does his homework. He tries to prepare. You know, he makes decisions uh, based on uh, the best evidence available to him. And I just think that that 3 a.m. call or any other 
part of the job uh, is going to come naturally to him because he has seen it up close and personally for eight years. You are uh, the only person who has debated Trump one-on-one. Mm. Uh, first debate is September 29th, I believe. Do you have any advice uh, for Joe Biden going in other than like carry a taser? <laughs> I think he's going to be very well prepared because I, I know um, some of the people that are leading his debate uh, preparation team. And now that the convention is um, uh, over, he's going to be able to turn his attention to that because that'll be the next big moment uh, in the presidential campaign. And I think obviously being prepared, but also recognizing that this is not like any other experience he's ever had in politics because he is on a stage with someone who lies with impunity, with actual real delight, who has absolutely no compunction about saying anything, whose idea of preparation is just making stuff up and uh, throwing it out there. So on the one hand, you have to be prepared yourself uh, because you owe it to the American public to try to answer the real questions. You cannot get distracted or diverted by the, you know, reality show that's going on on the stage right next to you because that's what it is, uh, and you can't take the bait. I mean, it's a really complicated calculation dealing with someone uh, like that. But I, I think I did well with the, the three encounters I had with them, and I'm very confident that uh, Joe is going to really knock it out of the park. Well, again, knock wood. <laughs> Uh, We have to take a quick break, but stick around, everybody. We'll be right back with more Hillary Rodham Clinton.